good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Stern, and I'm the founder and president of the Endowment for Middle East Truth. And it is indeed my profound pleasure to welcome every one of you here today to hear some wonderful experts. As you all know, on July 15th, the world awoke to the news of an attempted military coup against Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his authoritarian Islamist Justice and Development Party. Mr. Erdogan has called the failed coup in which 246 people were killed along with 24 coup plotters, quote, a gift from God. And he's used it as a pretense to consolidate his power. Since the failed military coup, Mr. Erdogan has um, used this as a charade to arrest more than 16,000 people and detain over 22,000 people and has fired some 68,000 people from their jobs. He's used the attempted coup as an ex used to crack down on large swaths of Turkish society, including firing tens of thousands of military officers, artists, journalists, university professors, teachers, judges, and civil servants, and just about anyone else that Mr. Erdogan feels is a threat to his regime. Um, he has also used the coup as a pretense for requesting the extradition from the United States to Turkey of his one-time loyal friend, Vatula Golan, who, was, um, who, out of his compound in Pennsylvania, operates a rather clandestine chain of Muslim schools in the United States, as well as in Turkey. Turkey, as you know, is a NATO ally, and the United States does um, use the Interlik Air Base for launching attacks against the Islamic State. However, the amount of support that Turkey has given to fighting ISIS has been very minimal at best. Mr. Erdogan has said that he does not see Hamas as a terrorist organization, but he has been quick to condemn the United States for its support of the Syrian Kurds, whom he does regard as a terrorist organization. To make matters even more complicated, yesterday Mr. Erdogan flew to Moscow to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin, which indicates a sort of pivot towards Moscow and a distinct line of relationships between um, Turkey and Russia since Turkey shot down a Russian plane last November. Here to discuss these latest developments in Turkey is Dr. Jonathan Schanger, Shanzer, a good friend of mine whose name I can't pronounce right. <laughs> Dr. Shanzer um, is Vice President of Research for the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Um, Jonathan is a counterterrorism analyst who has worked at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he took part in the de designation of numer numerous terrorist financiers, and is um, a particular expert on many things, including um, the Iranian sponsorship of terrorism. He's a former research fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and he's authored several Middle East-focused books. Um, some of which I highly, highly recommend. Dr. Chancer, all of which I should say. <laughs> Dr. Chancer has um, studied Middle East history in four countries. He earned his PhD from King's College of London, where he wrote his dissertation on the US Congress and its efforts to combat te terrorism in the 20th century. We are also honored today to have um, Dr. Eichen Artemer. Um, Ikin is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He is a former member of the Turkish parliament from 2011 to 2015, who served in the EU Turkey Joint Parliamentary Committee. Um, the EU Harmonization Committee and the Ad Hoc Parliamentary Committee on the IT Sector and the Internet. Um, we're, we're particularly lucky to have him today because he has been an outspoken defender of pluralism, minority rights, and religious freedoms in the Middle East. Um, Dr. Erdemar has been on the forefront of the struggle against religious um, persecution, hate crimes, and hate speech in Turkey. Um, he is a founding member of the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief and a Drafter of the signatory uh, and signatory to the Oslo Charter for Freedom and Religious Belief, as well as a signatory legislator um, to the London Declaration on Combating 
anti-Semitism. He has his master's and doctorate from Harvard University, and we are extremely honored to have him with us today. Um, so, Jonathan, did you want to go first? Well, thank you, Sarah. It's wonderful to be here today. Uh, very much appreciate the invitation, and it's an honor uh, to speak alongside uh, Icon, uh, who just recently joined FTD's growing F uh, uh, turkey program. Um, let me just say that uh, the reason why FDD has a growing turkey program is that we've seen a lot of troubling trends. Uh, things that uh, have preceded the, uh, the failed coup uh, of uh, July 15th by many, many years. And uh, what I thought I would do today before Icon talks about what's been happening in Turkey over the last several weeks is to give you a sense of why we've been looking at Turkey with such alarm. Um, and to give uh, a little bit of a sense of the challenges that I think we're going to see uh, between the United States and Turkey as this uh, drama continues to play out. Um, so the, uh, the beginning of the story, at least as I would tell it, is, um, it, is, is not actually with the, with the, the ascension of the AKP to power, um, uh, but rather four years ago. Uh, four years ago is when uh, FDD really began to look at Turkey as a problematic country. In fact, we, we started to create a, a new category for it. There's, you know, there's friends and there's enemies. We put Turkey in the frenemy uh, category uh, very squarely after this. And this was, in 2012, we learned about a scheme that was going on between the government of Iran and the government of Turkey. This was called the Gas for Gold Scheme. Um, and uh, this was at the height of the sanctions regime against Iran. We were trying to, to kind of uh, force the Iranians to come to the table and to relinquish that nuclear program. Uh, and uh, the, the international sanctions regime was in full force. And it was exactly at that time that we began to see that the Turks were sending uh, gold to Turkey in huge quantities, or, uh, or the Turks were sending it to Iran in huge quantities. Uh, as it turns out, the gas for gold scheme was, uh, it totaled uh, upwards of $15 billion dollars in gold that was being sent to Iran in exchange for energy. Um, the, uh, the sanctions evasion that we were seeing at that time was technically uh, legal. It was a loophole that Congress eventually closed. It took a lot longer than I think many had hoped for that loophole to be closed. It took about six months, which enabled Iran and, and Turkey to continue uh, to make these uh, swaps gas for gold. But at the end, that $15 billion was a significant achievement for the Iranians in sanctions evasion. At the time, their total estimated liquid uh, cash reserves was $25 billion. So it, it totaled more than half of what the Iranians had in the bank at that time. And this was very much due to uh, Turkish complicity. Uh, then the following year, we began to see some very troubling reports in eastern Turkey. Uh, this was on the southeastern border. We began to see, the, obviously, the rise of the Islamic State. And it appeared that uh, Turkey was ignoring a huge amount of activity that was taking place on that southeastern border. That we saw the flow of, uh, of fighters that would, many, I mean, many, many fighters would come to Turkey. They would fly to Istanbul, make their way east, and then cross the border. And the Turks were apparently just, uh, I mean, there, uh, it, was a, it was a blind eye approach that they were allowing this to take place, and no one seemed to be cracking down on this. But it wasn't just people, uh, it wasn't just the fighters. We saw weapons coming through in mass quantities. We saw bulk cash smuggling across that border. Uh, and then um, uh, on, in the other direction, we saw it was the Islamic State making a lot of money uh, through the sale of oil. And Turkey was one of the key outlets for the Islamic State to sell its oil, also uh, antiquities. Uh, that, that you know, we saw over and over again that the Islamic State was uh, ravaging these uh, uh, these uh, protected sites, uh, cultural heritage sites, and they were selling the antiquities over the border uh, into uh, into Turkey. Uh, this, of course, was deeply offensive to anyone watching, knowing, of course, that the, the Turks are a NATO ally and they should be working with us to crack down the Islamic State. They had a very good reason, at least in, the, in their minds, to want to do this. They were very much against the Assad regime and its slaughter of hundreds of thousands of people in, inside Syria. 
And that's something that I very much agree with, that our policy here in the United States has been deeply flawed, that we've allowed Assad and the Iranians and Hezbollah and the Shiite militias to engage in mass slaughter with impunity, but it was the way that Erdogan handled this, the way that the AKP handled it, that I take issue with today, because essentially what we see now is, is, is a classic case of blowback. If you've been watching the news in Turkey, you've seen that the Islamic State has carried out terrorist attacks inside Turkey itself. This is due to the fact that the Turks had allowed their country to be exploited by this very dangerous terrorist organization. They mistakenly believed that the jihadists were only going to be interested in taking their shots at the Assad regime or against Hezbollah or the Iranians inside Syria itself and didn't believe that as they drew closer to the United States, worked with us with regard to the counter-ISIL coalition, they somehow believed that they were immune from these attacks, and I think we've seen now that they've paid the price. Um, the story continues in September 2013. This was, I think, probably a footnote, but I think an important one to point out, and that is that uh, the Turks engaged in an agreement with a Chinese company. It's called the Chinese Precision Machinery Export Import Corporation. You don't need to remember the name, but what you should know is that this company was sanctioned by the U.S. government for uh, its involvement with the Iranians, that it was helping Iran uh, achieve certain aspects of its nuclear program. It was designated for proliferation reasons uh, by the Treasury Department, and it turns out that uh, the Turks uh, engaged in this agreement to purchase missile defense systems that were uh, making our other NATO allies uh, very nervous. In other words, once you invite this Chinese defense system to be integrated with the other systems that the Turks had in place in Turkey, what you had was the potential for cyber intrusions and infiltrations that Ch the Chinese would be able to learn a lot about the immense weaponry that we had provided to the Turks. Now, over time, uh, this deal evaporated, that enough uh, NATO protests that ultimately led to, to the deal's collapse. But the fact that the Turks were even considering doing this with the Chinese against the express wishes of NATO was significant. And it also came at the same time that we, have, we heard over and over again from the Turks that they were more interested in perhaps joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, turning their back on NATO, something that we just saw just a glimpse of yesterday when, uh, when the president of Turkey met with Vladimir Putin. Uh, and, uh, in December of 2013, we saw the leak of uh, the Istanbul Prosecutor's Report. Now, this was a remarkable moment for those who were watching the Turkish-U.S. Uh, relationship, in particular those who have been watching the internal politics of Turkey. If you're wondering about the roots of this Gulen uh, Erdogan battle. It really came with the release of that report. Actually, there were some leaked um, uh, uh, emails and tweets that came out before then, but this report was a massive leak alleging a huge illicit finance scandal perpetrated by Erdogan, his family, and the inner circle of the AKP. Um, and it led to a crackdown, it led to a crackdown of the Gulenis, but at the same time, as much as maybe this was not legally leaked, we learned quite a bit about how the Iranians uh, were working with the Turks. They were laundering hundreds, uh, more than $100 billion worth of illicit finance. We saw classic money laundering techniques. There was one case I remember specifically where brown sugar was being sold for $430 a pound. Uh, as a means to move money from one country to the other. We saw massive violations of, uh, of, uh, of sanctions that we had placed on Turkey, or uh, rather on Iran, and, um, and so it just gave us a sense of what was going on at that time, that the uh, gas for gold scheme was not a limited issue from 2012, but that it really continued onward into 2004, uh, to 2013. Uh, in 2014, we saw Turkey's removal from a gray list um, uh, from the Financial Action Task Force. For those of you who are not familiar with the FATF, the FATF, this is essentially the United Nations of Terror Finance. Um, and many people were touting this as good news. That, hey, look, Turkey's got terror finance laws that are compatible with those of the West, and isn't this a wonderful thing that they're off the gray list? Here's the problem. They were on the gray list for seven years. That they were deemed to be out of compliance with international terror finance laws for seven years until 2014. And this again, it's just very troubling when you think about the fact that we have a NATO ally, a strong US ally, that was so out of compliance, so out of touch with, uh, with our terror finance laws during a crucial time in the, in the war against terrorism. Uh, 
Then came the summer of 2014. That was a fascinating thing also to watch because this was, of course, the Gaza war between uh, 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 Hamas and the Israelis. Now, many people remember that war because of the, the 51 days of rocket firing back and forth and the Israelis showcasing Iron Dome as this major technological achievement. But most people forget how that war was launched. That war broke out because of the kidnapping and killing of three teens in the West Bank. Um, the person who was responsible for planning that attack, for financing that attack, uh, was a guy by the name of Salah Harori. Salah Harori is the, uh, was the founder of the West Bank Qassam Brigades. This is the armed wing of Hamas. Harori was based in Turkey since 2011. And he was operating there with the full knowledge of the Turkish government. And in fact, what we've learned since is that there's another dozen or so Hamas operatives that are still operating inside Turkey day in and day out, involved in financing, involved in the public relations of the organization, and in some cases involved in the logistics of terrorist attacks. The Turks very much are sponsors, along with the Qataris, of Hamas. And again, raising very, very difficult questions about what Turkey is doing in the NATO alliance. Uh, the Turks uh, fought against joining the anti-ISIS coalition, and in fact it was only this time last year that they actively began to take part in the counter-ISIL coalition. This came amidst, I mean look, the, the Turks have a border that they share with ISIS-held territory. It was a NATO country that refused to get involved in the war, and it was a deep source of frustration for the United States, and a deep source of frustration that we couldn't use the Indrilik Air Base, a, a known NATO asset where there are quite a bit uh, there's quite a bit of uh, American hardware there and a very close proximity for search and rescue missions and a bunch of other things would be crucial to the United States in this, in this conflict and the Turks were dragging their feet. So you see this huge um, sort of negative trend in terms of foreign policy where the Turks were up against the United States clashing with us on a number of <coughs> core issues and all the while we began to see this uh, authoritarian trend of Recep Tayyip Erdogan that we saw the crackdown on the press, we saw the jailing of them. Turkey is a leading jailer of journalists to this day, a quashing of inquiry at the judiciary, ICON, that's actually how we met, where ICON was uh, using some of the research that FTD had produced and was trying to get the Turkish parliament to look into these things, and the inquiries were being quashed one after another. And so, um, and, and also we've seen the consolidation of power of Erdogan himself, moving from, uh, from prime minister to president and now in the process trying to change the system of Turkey from a parliamentary one to an executive presidency. This has all been a very uh, negative trend line that we've been watching from the AKP, from, uh, from the AK party. Uh, meanwhile, we've seen anti-Americanism on the rise in response. Uh, the United States has engaged in quiet outreach. We've tried to get the Turks to back down from a lot of the rhetoric that they've engaged in. This has not worked. Uh, this brings us again to July 15th, um, and the crackdown continues, and ICON will talk about this, but the consolidation of power under Erdogan, I think, has been accelerated as a result uh, of this coup, and so um, there's concern now. There's concern that Turkey may be withdrawing from the U.S. partnership, and to be very clear, Turkey is a crucial ally of the United States. Geographically, it's crucial. It, it's, it's right on the edge of Europe and, and the Middle East, that it has long served as a crucial means to deploy assets to Europe, to the, uh, uh, to the Middle East and beyond. It served as an important buffer, a deterrent against Russia. To lose Turkey as an ally would be catastrophic for the United States, but yet here we are right now watching the Turkish president travel to Russia, reach out to Vladimir Putin, and this is, I mean, for those who say that this has nothing to do with the NATO alliance, I beg to differ. This was a very clear message as the Turks continue to say that the United States played a role in, uh, in the coup, that we are harboring Fethullah Gulen, that the CIA was behind this, that the Pentagon was behind this, and then to go to Russia and to meet with Vladimir Putin, it sent a very chilling message. And so, um, we see this potential downgrading of ties, and we're deeply concerned right now about the fate of Indrilik. We currently have 1,500 uh, U.S. servicemen who are based in Indrilik right now. Uh, we have a squadron of A-10s. We have armed drones that are based there. 
Uh, and we have assets that are deployed elsewhere. We have another 1,000 or 1,500 uh, servicemen uh, in, um, who are uh, serving in other parts of the country. There's advanced radar. There's search and rescue missions and squadrons that are there. And in fact, we have wide, it's widely reported, although never admitted by the US government, but nukes are there. We have nuke, tactical nuclear weapons inside Turkey. And all of these things right now, uh, you get a sense that they are at risk that as Turkey continues to flirt with the idea of turning its back on the United States, turning away from NATO, the anger that we see toward the United States. So we have a real compelling need to try to bring Turkey back into the fold. Um, it's hard to do this when Turkey is blaming us for the coup. Again, blaming the Pentagon, blaming the CIA, blaming, uh, uh, blaming this country for harboring those who they say are behind it. Um, and you know, one other thing that I think is just worth noting, and we can talk about this a little bit later, but to the extent that uh, the ties are strained now, it could get worse. And not because of uh, new coup plots being uh, uh, unearthed, but because there is a trial that is about to take place in New York. That one of the individuals who is involved in that gas for gold trade and the illicit finance that I mentioned earlier, his name is Reza Zarab. Z-A-R-R-A-B, this is an important name to remember. Zarab was a key figure in uh, sending the, the gold and the cash in between both Iran and Turkey. And uh, he is now about to stand trial here in the United States for sanctions evasion. It is likely, not a guarantee, but likely that when uh, he does stand trial, that he will testify to the fact that the ruling uh, party of Turkey, that the Erdogan family itself was very much involved in this illicit financial activity. And this will, I think, really not be taken very well by Erdogan or his son, who were, who were uh, key players in this, um, uh, uh, in this scandal. Um, but look, the, the, I'll, I'll just end on this, that um, the core concern that we have and all the foreign policies that I mentioned, the consolidation of power, the, the core concern that we have is, is Erdogan's Islamist and authoritarian trend. This is what we've been watching for the last several years, and we continue to watch it with great alarm and concern as we see a NATO ally drift uh, from, from the alliance. The, the coup itself was uh, an affront to democracy, to, uh, to liberalism, it was an affront to NATO values. But I can also say very clearly, and we should condemn that coup, but I should also say very clearly that what we have been seeing on the part of Erdogan and the AKP has also been an affront to democracy and to NATO values. So the key here now is to try to keep NATO or to keep Turkey close to, to NATO, to keep it part of the alliance, while also fighting a lot of these dangerous trends. How to do that will be very delicate, uh, but I think this is ultimately in the American interest. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Um, I would like to follow up on that wonderful introduction which gives you a, a, a great context. And I think the key to understanding Turkey is to make sure that you keep your eye on the context. And when I say context, not just short-term context, but long-term context. Because after all, Turkish President Erdogan is a master mind of framing and reframing. He will frame each crisis, each issue in a short-term context. Uh, the only way to counter that is to make sure that we get long-term context. So what Erdogan reframes in a short-term context needs to be framed again in a longer context. For example, the coup. Sure, uh, if you just focus on this coup and its details, it might come as puzzling, but if you take a look at Turkey's history of coups, it makes a lot of sense. Turkey had successful coups in 1960, 71, 1980, 1997, and failed coups, 1962, 63, and depending on how you look at it, maybe even the, the, the postmodern coup, the so-called the E-coup of 2007 was also a failed coup. So this is a, a, a country with a very problematic relationship between the civilian and the military. So Turkey has failed, despite various European Union reforms, to institutionalize civilian control over the military. That's number one. Number two is, Turkey's military lacks a culture of accountability and transparency. 
that uh, has produced these outcomes. And third, Turkey's culture of impunity, not only concerning the military, but concerning the political class. Uh, people know that they can get away with torture, with extrajudicial killings, with coup d'etats, uh, with uh, undermining rule of law and due process. Now, that's one of the long contexts I wanted to remind you. The second one is, today it all looks as if, uh, you know, there is this ongoing war between Gulen, Fethullah Gulen, the reclusive cleric based here in the US, and President Erdogan. Uh, but let's take a look, look at its deeper history. So uh, we're talking about two different um, Islamic traditions. You know, Erdogan comes from a long line of political Islamists who see themselves in the Sayyid Qutbian line of Islamic revolutionaries, who have been also inspired greatly by the Iranian uh, revolution, uh, and uh, who used to be organized under the umbrella of national vision, Milli Gurush. So Erdogan's mentor, uh, Nejmetin Erbakan, was the mastermind of this movement, and since 1969, uh, they have operated under different Islamist parties. And only with the founding of the current AKP in 2001, which demonstrated a, let's say, a break on the part of Erdogan from his mentor, Erbakan, uh, that we see the rise in, in, in the current form of Islamic politics. Now, where does Fethullah Gülen fit into this picture? Uh, Gülen's community comes from a different line, different intellectual trajectory. They're not Qutbian, they're not Islamic revolutionaries. In fact, they have almost always, until 2001, uh, sided with other political parties. So there would be Islamist parties, and the Gülen community would almost always work with other center-right conservative parties and never with the Islamist parties. So, and, and, and there was an intellectual as well as a, a, a political rivalry between the two. Turkey's Islamic revolutionaries, the Qutbian kind, the national vision kind, they always believed in political parties, contesting elections, and coming to power. Whereas Gülen community believed in building networks, uh, believed in influence through bureaucracy and yielding influence through uh, supporting other political parties, but never through their own political party. Now, the two traditions, they all also had very different outlooks vis-a-vis -vis foreign policy. The Gulen community would be more transatlantic, they would be pro-EU, pro-NATO, they would be very pragmatic toward Israel and other neighbors, whereas the national vision would be fiercely anti-Western, anti-NATO, anti-EU, anti-OSCE, anti-European Convention on Human Rights, and so on and so forth. So what made a difference is, back in 2001, once the AKP was established, these two forces came together. Probably it was less an attraction than a push by Turkey's uh, secular nationalist establishment. Meaning, I think these two traditions felt equally victimized. They joined hands and had a landslide victory right after a horrible economic you know, crisis uh, and used this opportunity. Now, this alliance, I think, worked quite well uh, all the way until December 2013 when they had a massive fallout with the corruption probe, with the graft probe in Turkey. Uh, and since December 2013, what we are seeing is this bitter rivalry between former allies. So I think it's important to keep this context in mind to make sense of what's happening now, to make sense of the Turkish government propaganda, to make sense of what Turkish kind of diplomats, uh, NGO experts, academics, and journalists are uh, kind of propagating abroad. Uh, again, another issue to get beyond the context is the psyche. What's the Turkish psyche at this point? Uh, there is a strong desire for you, for the Western audiences, to acknowledge that this was a real coup. Turks go crazy when they hear that this could be a scenario, this could be a conspiracy, this wasn't a real coup, this was staged. And how to make sense of that uh, sentiment, and that is, because unlike other coups, this was the, the bloody coup. Uh, this was this cost uh, this cost over 270 lives, uh, not counting the coup plotters. And this was the first time Turkish citizens witnessed military fighting military, military fighting police, military fighting the Turkish intelligence agency, 
This is the first time they've seen F-16s bomb the parliament. This is a parliament which was never targeted before. Even during the time of the War of Independence in the 1920s, it was always away from the, 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 the field of war. So this is the first time they saw uh, Turkish fighter planes shooting down Turkish military helicopters. So this was extremely traumatizing on Turkish citizens, and hence the ongoing demand from the West to say this was a real coup, we sympathize with you, we're sorry for your loss, and full stop. Now, that's the problematic part. Of course, uh, there were a lot of expressions of sympathy. In fact, only five days after the coup, uh, the UK's uh, Europe and America's minister paid his first official visit in office to Ankara. But if you go back to the psyche, still to this day, even the speaker of the president, Ibrahim Kalin, will argue that no Western head of state, no Western minister uh, has set foot in Ankara to you know, pay their sympathies. Which means there is a, a, an important kind of uh, reality gap, meaning uh, I think it, it, even top-level officials like the president's spokesperson, who knows that there had there have been Western visits and messages of sympathy, would still like to argue that there hasn't been one. So it's it's almost this delusional state of affairs. Now let's move on to a counterfactual question: What would have happened had the coup succeed? Now. I would argue it would be even more disastrous. There would be widespread executions, more killings, not just three digits, but maybe four digits. Uh, there would be torture, similar purges, massive incarceration, uh, and uh, a collapsed economy. Now that the coup failed, in fact, not much has changed. I call it a lose-lose scenario, meaning no matter what happened, once someone pushed the button uh, for a coup or once the coup plotters started rolling the tanks, I think it was beyond the point of no return. Turkey now has, you know, uh, these lynchings, mass in imprisonment, purges, witch hunts, torture, starvation, rape uh, of people detained, and so on and so forth. And, of course, Although this is the state of affairs, when you take a look at Turkish society, you see a, a very different sentiment and performance. Because you, we see a spirit of national unity. We see these mass rallies all across the country. We have seen over a million and a half people uh, gathered together in Istanbul. And we see that for the first time again in Turkish history that these rallies are cross-party to a great extent with the exception of the pro-Kurdish HDP, and I'll come to that at the end. But so there is now uh, a, an urge to demonstrate this spirit of national unity, and uh, part of it is real. I know it doesn't look real, but part of it is real, meaning people are really desperate to be involved in these performances of unity and solidarity after going through that trauma. But part of it is fear. That is, if you do not, just like in many other totalitarian countries, for any other good example, think of North Korea and how you need to cry and mourn for the loss of your leader. It's exactly the same. Now, you have to join these rallies. You have to write op-eds. You have to tweet. If you're a corporation, if you're a company, you have to pay huge sums to have these full-page ads in dailies, on TV, to say that we are against the coup, we hate the coup plotters, long live Turkey, we are with the president. So there's this enormous pressure to do it. If you're not a willing participant in this demonstration of solidarity, you are forced into it because everyone knows there is no due process. Everyone knows there is no rule of law. Everyone knows it will take only one person and and uh, one call to the police, one email, one anonymous call to the police for you to lose your business, your family, your life. You'll end up in prison. If you're lucky, they'll let you go after 30 days. 
Uh, because right now, under state of emergency uh, provisions, you can be jailed for up to 30 days without access to a lawyer or your family. I had a colleague who I can't name. Uh, she's, you know, hardline secularist. She finds me too kind of lenient on Islamists. And she was uh, jailed for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, they told her, oops, sorry, we just have to make sure. So this is the kind of potential risk that Turkish citizens see, and they simply play along. Now, what makes this spirit of consensus possible? Because there are also other structural factors that feed into it beyond fear. One is this grand coalition that came around dislike of Gülen and Gülen community. Uh, because until recently, uh, Gülen community, through its uh, influence in the judiciary and the police and the media, especially, uh, went after the pro Kurdish HDP. So a lot of Kurdish politicians believe that the Gülen community, together with Erdogan, was behind these mass incarceration of Kurdish politicians. For the seculars and for the uh, center left politicians in Turkey, they see again the Gülen network together with Erdogan. Uh, staging these show trials against secular military, uh, going after secular NGOs and victimizing them and their businesses and nonprofits. Uh, when it comes to um, the AKP and uh, Erdogan loyalists, they see Gulen as a former ally who has defected and now see him as a traitor and are now going after their former allies with a vengeance. Now the, the problem there is, uh, since they have been working together since 2001, that is 12 years of working together, that is, they end up being privy to a lot of secret tricks and information about one another, I think that that's really a problematic issue, meaning there is a limit to which Erdogan can go after the Gulen community. Sure, he's going on with the purges and <coughs> incarceration, torture, uh, ex uh, kind of expropriation. Uh, but ultimately, there will always be a limit because there is a shared dirty laundry that cannot be spilled because that will be the end of the AKP. Now, and, and another common denominator is, of course, Turkey's <coughs> culture of conspiracies, xenophobia, uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Christian ethos, as well as anti-Western and anti-American sentiment. And since all of these go across the board, across the political spectrum, that also acts as a glue that holds people together. Just to give you one statistics, uh, according to an ADL poll, Turkey has more anti-Semitism than Iran. And according to World Value Surveys, uh, Turkey is one of the most xenophobic countries in the world. When asked, who is your enemy? The whole world, to an average Turkish citizen, is an enemy. Turks, and when, when they ask, who is your friend? Turks can't be a friend. Which means, your average Turkish citizen, for one reason or another, and this is, this is not limited to the AKP, this is something about the Republican history, this is a country that feels everyone is out there to get Plus, there is not a single friend in the world. So it's, it's quite a miracle that Turkey has been a member of the NATO, is an accession country to the European Union, has been a member of the Council of Europe right from the very start, and a member of the OIC, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Which, again, should remind us that how, how important these institutions are. Because ultimately, these institutions are anchors. These are anchors that hold Turkey, a, a society that's quite paranoid, xenophobic, and isolationist, engage with the transatlantic world. Now, let me conclude by taking a, a peek at the future and what can be done. First of all, behind this facade of unity, consensus, there is a systematic spirit of exclusion. Who is excluded to begin with? The pro Kurdish HDP people's democracy party. Uh, they were not invited to the presidential palace. They were not invited to the big cross party rally in Istanbul. 
and they're now not invited to the new constitutional talks. Second, Turkey's minorities, especially ethnic and religious minorities, for, despite the fact that they have been doing their best, they're doing utmost to show that they're in solidarity, they're patriots, they are with Turkey and the flag and the president. They have had a letter, they have had ads, they joined the rally in Istanbul. Uh, Turkey's Christian and Jewish leaders were present at the rally with their Turkish flags, with their Turkish caps, applauding Erdogan, and guess what they got in return? From the podium, they were insulted. They were referenced, there were references to the Byzantine seeds, which is an insult to the Greek Orthodox in the crowd. There, there was a reference to the Vatican plots, again, an insult to the Catholics and so on and so forth. So this will continue. Turkey's religious and ethnic minorities will continue to be labeled, used as a scapegoat, and marginalized. And tied to the coup plots, no matter what they do. As well as witch hunts and settling scores. So if you're on the wrong side of Erdogan, good luck. There was a labor union leader in Istanbul like, with a 30-year track record of socialist activism. He was arrested as part of this coup plot. There was an academic in Tunje, the, the, the Kurdish Alevi city, and there was this outspoken academic, a, 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 a known Marxist, atheist, and outlier person. He was arrested for being part of the Gülen network. And finally, when he was released, he had this wonderful speech. He said, for the first time in my life, being a Marxist and an atheist worked my favor. Because after 10 days, the police could realize that, hmm, probably this guy is not a humanist. You know, so, this kind of witch hunt and settling scores will continue. What to do? Let me end with this. First, continue to engage Turkey. So, this is very important for policymakers and also for other stakeholders. Continue to engage Turkey. Because uh, what Erdogan would like the most is isolation, is breaking bridges breaking these ties, because the more internal to Turkey, the stronger it will be. Second, make sure that prevention of Turkey's drift away from transatlantic values and institutions is a priority, is on the top of your list. Not to save Turkey, not out of benevolence for Turkey's citizens, but to save the transatlantic union, especially in this isolationist moment, both on the European side and on the North American side of this. Uh, because ultimately, Turkey is not just Turkey. Turkey is not just the second largest army in NATO. Turkey is not just uh, kind of a, a country of 80 million with a you know, significant economy and resources. <coughs> it's NATO's southeast flank, bordering Russia, Iran, Iraq, Syria, you know, Eastern Mediterranean. So Turkey is important. But the fact that Turkey is important doesn't mean that anything needs to be sugar -free. or Turkey needs to be cut some slack. That has been the mistake so far. What destroyed Turkey's democracy and institutions, believe me, uh, has been the cutting of slack on the Western end. Turkey should be held accountable. Turkey should be reminded of the norms and responsibilities. That this is a mutual relationship. That it should be a win-win relationship. It's not a one-sided relationship. And those who think they're doing Turkey a favor by cutting Turkey some slack are actually in a very condescending attitude. It's as if saying, you know what, we'll, we'll hold Germany to a higher standard than Turkey. No, hold Turkey to the same standards that you would hold Germany accountable to. When it comes to breach of rule of law, when it comes to anti-Semitism, when it comes to anti-Christian sentiment, when it comes to anti-American attitudes, when it comes to hate speech, when it comes to hostile moves, Turkey should be held to the exact same standards as other NATO members, as other Council of Europe members. And I think that has been the one major shortcoming on the Western policymakers' scene. And finally, and this is something I think Emmet has also been very involved in, it's very important to always point out to your Turkish counterparts that you are aware of the dual discourse. Tell them that you're aware there's a completely different discourse they use in Turkish and in Turkey, which is xenophobic, anti-Western, anti-Semitic, anti-Christian, anti-NATO, and a completely different one once they cross the Atlantic in English 
in European and American settings, where they kind of reframe their phrases, where suddenly they act democratic, pro-West. They use the language of tolerance. We tolerate you know, religious uh, difference and diversity. It's important to remind Turkey that as part of the NATO, as well as the Council of Europe, as well as the European Union, no one asks for tolerance. No one asks for an Ottoman benevolence. What's required, and these are part of the founding documents of these institutions, is for Turkey to treat each and every citizen as an equal citizen. No one has the right or the authority to tolerate another Turkish citizen. So Turkish policymakers should wake up from this dream of grandeur, that they are part of a ruling majority and that they, they, they are there to tolerate these kind of feeble beings, Kurds, Alevis, Jews, Christians, Yazidis, uh, at their will, uh, and instead uh, really live up to the standards of the institutions that, they're being, uh, that they have been a member of since the very start. And let me end with an anecdote to, to, to prove to you that another Turkey could be possible. Because we're too much under the influence of, uh, let's say, 15, 14 to 15 years of Erdogan damage. Uh, back in early 1940s, right after the war, when Europeans uh, were trying to put together a new union in the, in the form of a Council of Europe, and when they were trying to put together an assembly like a parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe. This is way before the European Union. Uh, Turkey was both treated differently, and Turkey was expected to answer to higher standards. So the first Turkish delegation to the parliamentary assembly, in the first meeting, was there speaking about the need to build a United States of Europe. So those were the Turkish legislators of the 1940s. And Turkish legislators were not there to beg to be treated differently or you know, cut us some slack, or they were not there to tell people that, you know what, we tolerate our minorities. On the contrary, they knew they were part of an alliance. And they said, we have suffered a horrible war. We have to overcome pain and enmity. I'm quoting a wonderful parliamentarian back then. And he said, we need to overcome all this history. And we need to build a United States of Europe of democracy and rights and freedom. So I think that's the Turkey all the way back in 1940s that I believe in, and that is possible. And if we start engaging Turkey the right way, guess what? I think we can go back to that Turkey. Otherwise, Turkey is right now on the highway to help, and it will not be its own demise, but it will also be, or could lead to the demise of the transatlantic values and alliance. Thank you.